next have a panel to tell us about what's happening in the world of artificial intelligence, the progress, discuss the myths and realities. To do that, who better than my dear friend and colleague as a moderator, Eric Horowitz. Eric, come on out. Eric's, of course, well. doctor, doctor, which you know. And he's also the head of our Redmond Research Lab. And I call him Mr. AI because he's been with the field as long as any of us. Was the president of our American Association of Artificial Intelligence. Now back again, Eric. Well, thank you very much. And let me introduce my, my guests, to our panelists today. Come on out. Welcome to the panel on progress in AI, myths, realities, and aspirations. Um, our, our guests today include Christopher Bishop, distinguished scientist, Microsoft Research on your, on your right. And next to him, uh, Oren Etzioni, chief executive officer of the Allen Institute for AI. We call that AI2 for short around here in, in the Northwest. <laughs> Fei Fei Li, associate professor at Stanford University. Michael Littman, professor of computer science at Brown University. And Josh Tenenbaum, uh, to my left, professor at MIT. Beyond our panelists, of course, we have uh, many experts in AI in, and related areas of computer scientists with us in the room here today. Um, and uh, I, I've uh, uh, asked the panelists, and I'll ask this audience to think as well today as we reflect together, uh, several framing questions. Where are we today with hype versus reality on the path to developing richer notions of machine intelligence along the lines of what the founders of AI dreamed about in the 1950s. Where will we be in 15 years? What are the biggest standing challenges? What are your best guesses on the technical and programmatic paths to addressing these challenges? And I'll start by framing the discussion just a bit with some comments on progress in AI. So uh, I view AI um, as the pursuit of the scientific understanding of the principles and mechanisms underlying thought uh, and intelligent behavior and their embodiment you know, in machines. And the field has its roots, as many of you know, in the early work of Turing and Church on computability and the later work uh, by uh, Turing and, and von Neumann on the notion of a universal computing machine, which lit up imagination about what we might do with these machines, including building minds one day. The phrase artificial intelligence was first used in early 1956 in a very prescient proposal, I, I refer that to folks to read all the time, for a workshop on machine intelligence that took place that summer at Dartmouth. And in a beautiful document, the co-authors called for research on machine methods of forming abstractions from sensory and other data, carrying out activities which may be best described as self-improvement, manipulating words according to rules of reasoning and rules of conjecture, and developing a theory of the complexity for various aspects of intelligence. Now, things moved quite fast at the outset, and there was a great deal of optimism about where the field was going. In 1965, Herb Simon, a mentor to many of us, uh, said that machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. Two years later, Marvin Minsky predicted, within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will substantially be solved. That would have been, uh, you know, the 90s. <laughs> Now, on the one hand, we've made great progress over the decades. There's been a palpable upswing lately. We saw some examples in the first session uh, today. And this work has been largely fueled by the explosive increase in the availability um, of data and computational power, and of course, some, some good ideas. Uh, we've made progress, especially on building out narrow, what I, what I refer to as deep, uh, but narrow wedges of competency, such as uh, work on the models of classification. Uh, prediction, ranking, work in vision and speech recognition, uh, and natural language processing. And these advances have quickly found their way into our products and the products of our competitors, uh, and indeed are defining a shared competitive landscape now uh, for success in industry. On the other hand, it's been a slow slog <laughs> on the dream of building machines that show the kind of, of deep uh, more general intelligence exhib exhibited by people, I'm sure the founding fathers of, uh, of AI would likely be rather uh, taken aback if they saw where we were uh, in 2015 about our understanding of the magic, which we still call magic, behind human level abilities to reason, learn, understand with the common capabilities 
and the common sense that even small children have. One might even say that the 1956 proposal, if properly reformatted, it could be resubmitted to the NSF or DARPA today, <laughs> and we'll probably get some funding by some excited program managers. <coughs> even though the progress on building out deep brain intelligence has been slow, um, researchers do have fabulous intuitions. They're working on the things that excite them the most, on the path to answering some of the bigger, deeper questions on the challenges and frontiers, and how we might get to the next level. And this is why I've invited these particular folks up today uh, to help us as guides and as sextants in where to go next. And uh, so I asked each just to share five minutes of reflections, and then we'll open it up. So Chris, why don't you go ahead? OK, thanks, Eric. So um, I guess maybe a good place, is my microphone working, by the way? OK, great. Um, so I think a good place to start is just, just to acknowledge the fact that this has been a tremendously exciting few years, and we're living in a very, very exciting time. And obviously one of the reasons behind that has been the spectacular successes in a number of problems, as Eric has already hinted at, in, in the use of neural networks and so-called deep learning. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of neural networks. I, I started out my career in physics and uh, I switched into computer science uh, in what you might call the second wave of excitement in, in neural <laughs> networks around the sort of late 1980s. Uh, and I thought this was a really great way to approach artificial intelligence by learning from data. And uh, today we're in the third wave of excitement around neural networks. And um, as Eric has mentioned, there are really three factors behind this, behind the fact that we can have um, much better performance now on a whole range of tasks than we would have had uh, a decade ago. So one of the factors is the availability of huge amounts of data compared to what we had in the, in the 1990s. The second is a huge increase in, in compute power um, compared to what we had back then. And then also um, some, I think, relatively minor but important technical advances. So really the whole idea of um, deep learning, deep networks has, has been around a long time. I, I read a textbook on neural networks which was published 20 years ago, and there it talks about multi-layer convolutional neural networks for invariant object recognition. Um, but today we have systems, as some of, some of the other panelists have developed, which have um, really human-level performance on many of these tasks. Now. Um, the fact that we've been able to take some of these 20-year-old ideas and accelerate them through more data, more compute, and a few tweaks to some of the, the algorithms uh, means that maybe some of those other ideas that have been around for a long time could be ripe for big advances. So I do feel the next few years is tremendously exciting for the field of machine learning. And, and I guess I'm sort of implicitly assuming that the machine learning is going to be the thrust of our approach <laughs> to artificial intelligence. Maybe there are other ways we should approach this. But I think machine learning will be at the heart of it. And, and I'm sure neural networks and deep neural networks will be components in, in any larger and more capable system that we build. Um, so are we kind of nearly done? Are we nearly at AI? Well, I, I think not. And, and deep neural networks and similar technologies, for all their advantages, they have a lot of limitations. So one of them, of course, is that in, in standard approaches, they're trained using labeled data. And although data is plentiful, the labels typically are not. Often the labels are obtained by humans, perhaps hundreds of thousands of hours of human effort to get those labels. Whereas the human brain seems to learn mostly from unlabeled data. You know, kids crawl around the world and they just sort of take all this stuff in. And occasionally, mum and dad says, oh, that's a cat, that's a dog. But you don't have to see 27,000 examples of a cat before you begin to sort of get the idea of what a cat is. So there's something, um, something that we're missing um, in, those, uh, in those techniques. And I, and I guess I'm fast running out of time, but I have a few thoughts on what the next steps might be. So a little bit later, we can, we can talk about some of those. Um, so in terms of where we've got to, where we're going to get to, I actually think we've made a very big advance in the last five years towards artificial intelligence in a general sense. And by a big advance, I, I would guess we're sort of, we, we're 2% of the way there compared to where we were five <laughs> years ago. Okay? So 50 more of those big advances and I think we'll have something pretty exciting. Great. Well, you came in under time, so uh, oh. Warren, go ahead. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'll take up his, uh, his extra time. No. no. <laughs> I, uh, I know uh, Eric runs a tight ship. We, we're not allowed to use slides, so I, I have some notes. And, uh, I, I, say, I, I say that several folks on the panel said, well, no slides. I'll just do some, some uh, dancing on the stage, <laughs> some expressive 
physical activity. <laughs> I, I was planning on it, yeah. So I, I very much agree with what Chris said about A, we're in the midst of what's called uh, AI spring, and that's where I can't show you the slides, so that was my spring dance. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, that uh, this AI spring and this big data paradigm, not just uh, neural networks, but more broadly machine learning algorithms, has some very clear uh, limitations. And uh, I just want to take that theme uh, two steps further. So again, as he said, uh, we need labeled data. Often uh, we don't have it. That's a wonderful uh, computer science problem, whether it's mechanical Turk or distance supervision. There's a variety of techniques for getting more semi-supervised learning, getting more uh, lear learned data. Uh, I would say that that's not enough. To me, a lot of what AI is, going back to Herb Simon, is the study of uh, problems that are very hard to formalize uh, or maybe even impossible to formalize directly. So I feel like once we've cast it as a technical machine learning problem, once we've identified the objective function and all we need to do is solve the optimization, it can still be a very hard uh, computer science problem. And actually, that's a great thing for us is collaborating with you know, folks like Jeff Dean and Google and others right, who come from different backgrounds and help us scale uh, our methods. Um, it, it's a wonderful success. But, but many of the most fundamental problems in AI, we don't know how to formulate the objective function in the first place. So uh, the problem that we're working on uh, at the Allen Institute is really taking AI grand challenge problems and figuring out how to map those to uh, technical computer science problems. Case in point, a problem that's near and dear to my heart is machine reading. Very simply, take a uh, textbook, say in biology, read the chapter in the book, and answer the questions in the back of the book. Okay. Very, very hard to turn that into any kind of reasonable optimization or machine learning problem. Uh, I mean, you, uh, it's, it requires a lot more decomposition, a lot more formalization to do that. It doesn't uh, just reduce to a simple uh, vector. And actually, I do think that you know, at AI, we've had these kind of hype cycles over, over expectations. While I love deep learning methods, I do worry when you start to see terms, like I saw recently, thought vectors, mm. where, where you were again, we're, we're verging into the hype cycle, because thought is not something that's expressible as a vector. Okay, it's just a little bit more uh, complicated than that. It's a tensor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even a little bit more, you know, a few more dimensions there. But uh, I like where you're going. The, the, the other point that, uh, that I wanted to make, and, and again, actually, just to, to stay with the greats, I, I thought Alan Newell put it incredibly well when he said, you can't play 20 questions with nature and win. You can't reduce... AI intelligence to a series of binary or even probabilistic distinctions. It's just more complex, requires reasoning, requires formalization, requires mapping from, say, how we think about things, how we think in language or in images, to uh, more, more formal structures. Anyway, that's, that's what we think about. I wanted to use my remaining one minute or so to also talk about the whole uh, fear thing, right? There's a lot of uh, concern about AI uh, more broadly in the popular community, right, with, you know, with movies and, and so on, but also even within the AI community, right? There have been various um, thoughts and useful discussions about how do we uh, uh, think about the threat of AI and so on. And I guess my, my specific thought on that is that I really want to emphasize uh, th the benefit of AI, the potential benefit. So when we think a thousand or a million years ahead, it's very easy to, to speculate. But if I think five, 10, 20 years ahead, what I end up with is uh, uh, with a quote from somebody that I really admire who said, it's the absence of AI technologies that's already killing people. <laughs> through errors, okay, and that's a quote from uh, uh, my friend Eric, uh, which I really think captures the fact that if we think about AI in a rational way as opposed to an emotional way, we need to weigh the costs and benefits and the risk. Let's not forget about the benefits. And whether those come from better academic search engines or whether those come from cars that will reduce, you know, intelligent cars that will reduce the number of accidents on the road or, you know, help in accessibility. There's so many uh, AI systems that can really make a difference and help us. And then people ask, well, what about uh, the distant future? And my last line, I want to quote from uh, John Markoff's uh, upcoming book. Uh, he has this great line and he says, don't mistake a clear view for a short distance. 
We have a clear view of where we want to go. I see in this room intelligent beings. It's not a short <laughs> distance by any means. Thank you. Fabulous. By the way, Eric, the, on the subject of thought vectors and this terminology, back in the 1990s, you probably remember, there was a, a very nice paper published. It was actually by Jan LeCun, I think, and co-authors. And it was very, it was um, essentially how to remove redundant parameters in a neural network. And it was a very sensible paper, a nice eigenvector analysis, absolutely beautiful. They decided to call the paper Optimal Brain Damage. <laughs> I, love, I love that title. <laughs> Fefe. Sure. Well, first of all, it's a very uh, um, great honor and humbling to be with these uh, great uh, researchers and scientists who have actually inspired my own work and mentored me when I was a student. So, um, so Eric, uh, when he invited us, he gave us the task of uh, discussing two things related to AI. Where have we been and where are we going? So. I want to make one analogy, and uh, Josh already and I dis uh, agreed backstage we're going to disagree, even no. though we actually like each other's work. <laughs> so um, everybody knows I'm a mom, or most of you in the audience knows I'm a mom. I'm a mom of a three-year-old. So if you had have recently had small kids, <laughs> or still remember having small the experience of having small uh, small kids, the first thing you probably remember is this term terrible too. But actually, what we don't talk about is there is a short stage before terrible too. They were just in total euphoria. And it's somewhere between, depending on your kid, one to two or one and a half year old, these babies are just so happy and they're just like little angels running around. They're not terrible yet. <laughs> but um, and I, my own kid also went through that and passed that. Um, <laughs> Take out the other side. Yeah. Um, I have a, 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 a hypothesis, and I, I'm, I promise I'll get to AI, um, of why this is. I think that around that time, the babies have made a huge developmental progress in their lives. And they're aware of that. And, and what I call that progress is actually the perceptual achievement, the perceptual progress. They've gone through so much actually hardship, being born and dealing with the world and, and for a year or two. They kind of have figured out some of the important basic tasks, especially it relating to um, matching patterns of objects, getting some of the words, even though language is still in formation, but they're starting to understand language so they can match a lot of the linguistic uh, vocal patterns. Uh, they, they, their perceptual, visual perception pattern recognition is, is doing really well. Their, their haptic pattern rec uh, recognition skill is also doing really well, and they start to actually put that together with motor skills. So, so there is this euphoria stage that we don't talk about. And I think we're in that euphoria stage in our AI <laughs> research. <laughs> and, and I think we deserve that. Uh, but I do want to point out, this is where I'm getting that. I think for the past 50 years, 60 years, after a lot of long history, I mean, starting from symbolic system, expert system, uh, statistical machine learning, we've got certain part of perception. I mean, I'm not saying we've solved object recognition or speech recognition 100%, especially when it comes to product. We still have a way to go. But I think today, where we have been is that we've hit a great progress for perception. But I do want to emphasize that, oh, first of all, Terrible 2 is coming, but no, just kidding. <laughs> I do want to emphasize that there's a lot more to perception itself, but really beyond perception is the word cognition. A lot of intelligence is about cognition. If you read the original Dartmouth, proposal by um, John McCarthy, you read the, really my favorite AI book, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvis' book about um, introduction to AI, you see that in, embedded in the definition of AI, um, if you unpack the word cognition, it involves acquisition of knowledge, representation of knowledge, abstraction, reasoning, planning, decision making. And this touches on a lot of the issues, Oren, and I think you guys will mention, you know, it's not that 
AI is not just about pattern recognition, especially with a clear objective function, which class of cat, or, or, or you know, where is the next eye movement? Even there, there's a lot of nuance. AI is really about uh, reasoning and, and, and formation of knowledge. And in my last 20 seconds, to just be a little technical, I think uh, where are we going, I want to emphasize on the word that Chris already used is learning. I think the past at least 20, 30 years, uh, machine learning has given us amazing algorithms focusing on pattern, rec uh, pattern matching and pattern recognition. I think the next stage I hope to get to is we, we learn to learn. We're learning in situations. We're learning in, in, in developing strategies, learning to acquire knowledge, learning to reason. And that's where I want to see AI going. OK, thanks very much, Michael. Great. So, um, so I guess we're at the end of the wonderful ones and about to head into the <laughs> terrible twos. That's sort of disturbing. But um, uh, I want to, you know, thank thank Eric for inviting me. It was really great to be a part of this, and uh, maybe maybe uh, you know, just surrounded by so many mentors and and uh, and, and thought leaders. Um, though I never I never thought of myself as a sextant symbol before. So it's, it's sort of. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cherish that, I think, for a while. I was, I was worried about that word not getting through correctly in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't quite make it in. Astrolabe, uh, we'll call it. Astrolabe. That's easier to say. I feel like that's worse, but OK. okay. Um, <laughs> great. So um, yeah, I, I really like this idea of, of, of objective functions that's come up, uh, both in the discussion and also in our, in our um, kind of setup in the green room beforehand. And it, and it does kind of point out, I think, two, two kind of Things that AI might mean. So, so if you if you think about the questions that Eric asked, there's there's this sort of aspect of AI as it is and as it's having impact on the world right now, and then there's AI as it was as a vision 50 years ago and as it you know for many people still is a vision now, and and what are the difference between those things and 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 what are the advantages and disadvantages and they, can they coexist and the pathways? Yeah, and how do we how do we get from here to there? And so I want to say that uh, that objective functions, in some ways, is kind of a is kind of a branch point for that. That one of the reasons that I think the the field has been very successful and has actually been able to accomplish an awful lot is because you know we, we now have as our practice we define a problem, we develop an algorithm to solve the problem, we maybe throw in a lot of data, we do some evaluation of that, and um, and if it doesn't work, we you know we turn the crank and try to try to do better. We try to engineer a better system. So those objective functions are incredibly powerful and incredibly useful in driving a kind of progress. Uh, but at the same time, defining those, the, the, the way that that setup has to happen is there's an objective function and then there's the system that's going to attack that objective function. And the objective function has to pre-exist the, 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 uh, the optimization of that objective function. It right? so doesn't, doesn't sort of make sense to do it any other way. But when you think about human cognition, when you think about intelligence, it's, it's not so clear cut. It's not so obvious what that objective function would be. And, um, and one of the ways that I've been thinking about this is, uh, I remember back, back to having kids, um, I also had kids at a certain point, and, um, and one of the things that I thought was pretty amazing was that um, the, the process of trying to learn to be funny. So um, <laughs> turns out to be a very hard objective function, especially for young kids. And there was this period that my son went through when he had gotten the syntax of jokes pretty much, but the semantics was simply not there, and there was no way to tell him no, you're not. That's not. That's not funny for this reason, <laughs> because if he knew that, it would have been funny in the first place. And so I actually find that to be a really powerful and interesting idea. That so much of of what we think of as intelligent behavior and human behavior is actually layered on top of layered on top of layered on top of layered, to the point where you can't set up the objective function in advance and then expect the system to kind of get there. You know, we we tried for a while of like, well, we'll not feed you unless you're funny. And so um, you know, it's a very clear objective function, very motivated to get it to work. But the fact of the matter is this, just, this is a terrible idea, right? So um, you, know, you lose a lot of kids this way. So, um, so we, we would only torture AI systems that way, not kids. <laughs> is that what you mean by reinforcement learning? Yeah, so uh, this, is, this is what we do in reinforcement learning. We put, yeah, put our, our machine learning algorithms in a box, and then we, we deprive them of things until they like, cry for mercy. So this is, this is turning out way more dark than I intended, so I apologize for that. <laughs> Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that sort of that notion of layering to me is actually really important, and I think it's something that we need to we need to rejoin as a field and really get back to some of these ideas of of systems that don't you know we have the objective function we shoot at the objective function we meet that and then we're done we put that system on the shelf it solves problems for us and we're really happy, but systems that are actually 
gaining capability over time, and that the new, objective, new objectives can actually be defined in terms of past competence. And so that's something that I think is really important. Machine learning, not just of here's a static data set, let's give it to it, but maybe us as people interacting with these systems, get, you know, getting them to a, to a new level of competence and then challenging them to go even further. And I don't think we have a good model of that at the moment, but I think that's a, that's a direction that I'd really like to go. Fabulous. Josh, you, you said it wasn't cleanup, it was called something else. Batting fifth. Batting fifth. <laughs> He's a baseball expert. Yeah. Um, so, so thanks. Yeah, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, uh, sort of echoing what a lot of the speakers said, I mean, obviously this is a golden age or, you know, the latest golden age for AI. And we, and we want to be thoughtful about what we're going to do with it and where we're going next. Um, you know, I'm, I'm partly an AI researcher. I'm partly a cognitive scientist. I try to reverse engineer how the human mind works in the same kinds of terms we would use to engineer more human-like AI. And I, I, I think that um, that's going to be important to... Uh, driving where we go next. Um, I, I look at all the success and I have to, as a cognitive scientist, I have to kind of, I have to admit, see the gaps. I think that the current excitement around, say, for example, you know, data-driven learning, the there's a clear scaling route there for certain kinds of tasks with well-defined objective functions. But the sense of general intelligence um, that's more flexible than just any particular task, a certain kind of common sense, I don't think that scaling route is, is going to get there. Not because it has in, inherent limitations, it's just not even trying, I think. So I want, but, but I, I think I'm, I'm inherently an optimist, and I think we actually do have good insights if we look to cognitive science, and if I can just do anything with my five minutes, is to point to the area of cognitive science, which I think is most, um, has the most valuable guiding vision for AI. Um, when I was in grad school, actually, um, I don't remember where he said this, but Bill Gates actually said this very well. He gave a talk in the mid-90s, and he, and he was talking about the, the early days of MSR, and one of the goals was to try to understand certain basic capacities of intelligence, seeing, and, and speaking, and he said, if we can only get computers to be as smart as a five-year-old, then that would be a huge uh, accomplishment and of great value. And um, you know, this, this idea that we should try to build AI by looking at the intelligence of young children and seeing the, the cognitive development path over the first months and years of life as a scaling route to AI, I think is a very valuable one, right? So Bill Gates said it, the early founders of AI, uh, Turing, Minsky, McCarthy, they all suggested that at key points of their career. Uh, when a lot of the, the deep learning people also talk in that way. Fei-Fei was talking that way, and I think, you know, I, I, I not only respect Fei Fei's research accomplishments, but her vision is, I, 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 you know, I think it's, it comes closer to what I'm talking about than a lot out there. But the thing is that it's not just enough to be really smart and to be an observant parent and to look at what your children were doing and try to think, oh, well, here's my kind of intuitive theory of what they're doing. There's an actual science of cognitive development. And just as there's been great progress over the last, say, two decades in AI research, there's been just as much transformative progress in the study of cognition in infants and young children. Um, and so that's in the first few months of life and the first few years. And I think when, when Bill Gates said, let's, let's aim for a five-year-old, he was already being too ambitious. Because even a one-year-old is more intelligent in, and has more common sense than any of our AI systems, um, even a six-month-old. And there's a lot of research about this. <laughs> and we should study it and learn what are the ways in which even a three-month-old has a certain kind of common sense. And then how does that change? What are the learning mechanisms, the real learning mechanisms, which grow that knowledge over the first few months, from three to six months, from six months to 12 months, from 12 to 18, and, and two years and three years? Each of those stages are different. They're, they're fairly well understood in a lot of empirical ways. There's a lot of data. It's not, there's not a lot of theory by the sort of formal standards that computer scientists would recognize. And it's one of the things that these fields can offer to each other. We, with our computational toolkit, can go and look at the empirical literature on how kids' thinking develops and actually contribute quite a lot. And similarly, that, that, that empirical study and the theories, that uh, the conceptual frameworks that developmental psychologists have built are hugely valuable. Just, I'll just give two key insights that I've learned from my developmental colleagues. Um, uh, one has to do with what we start with, and the other is how we actually learn. So from the very earliest ages, in some form, even like three or four month olds, about as early as you can study with current empirical methods, a human thought is structured around a basic understanding of physical objects, you know, things like 
this object here, this object here. Intentional agents, people like, you know, agents with minds, they don't have to be people. They could be dogs, computers, they could be balls. If they roll in the right way, we can see them as minds, things that have beliefs and desires. Okay? And the interactions between objects and agents. And this is a key insight. Infants don't, the, the, the brain does not start off filtering uh, filtering perceptual experience just in terms of features and more and more features, it's set up from the beginning to think in terms of objects, real things that are there, and agents. How many people have heard of um, object permanence? Okay, um, so m most hands go up. You probably heard about this from pop culture or from your intro site class. How many people have heard of Jean Piaget? Right, so he was the founder of developmental psychology, and he introduced this idea. Um, but you know, if that's where your developmental psychology ends, for example, how many people have heard of Liz Spelke? Okay, not as many hands. All right, um, she's one of the great modern developmental psychologists who studied infants' concepts of objects. This would be kind of like if your understanding of AI was, you know, in terms of Turing or Minsky, right? Um, great, but a lot has happened since then. So Piaget in introduced this idea that that there's a kind of perceptual achievement, to use Fay Fay's term, that infants by uh, one year of age come to see the world not in terms of just pixel data, but objects, right? But actually, as Spelke and others have shown, even three-month-olds already in some form have a proto-object concept. So objects, when you can't see this object, it's over here, it doesn't wink out of existence. You know, if I drop it, I don't know if you could hear that sound, I'll take something more massive, right? Right, <laughs> sorry, did that really hit you? No, I'm just kidding. Good. Um, <laughs> Um, so, the, you know, the ability to put together sights and sounds and to represent a world of things that even when you can't see them, that it, infants are set up from the beginning to do that, okay? And also to think about, and I'm worried now about how Eric is feeling, if I, if I you know, I was thinking about the, the common sense of social discourse yes. about people's feet yes. and okay. all that stuff. Not right? to do that, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, again, even a, even a, like a one and a half year old has a lot of common sense, uh, the ability to, you know, uh, uh, to recognize if somebody's reaching for something, that it's the thing they want, they're not just acting. If I drop something uh, you know, to help me pick it up and to distinguish the difference between setting something down so I'm done with it and dropping something and, and you know, then your, your wonderful one-year-old, uh, part of how they're so bright is they will see that they, they, yeah. they, you know, the ability to help you that those wonderful ones do. If, if we could build robots that have that intuitive sense of other people's goals and how to be helpful, that would be huge. The other thing, again, is about the learning mechanisms that grow this knowledge. It's not just about a kind of statistics on a grand scale, but in the same way that these, these you know, again, to echo themes of some of the other speakers here, that the early knowledge isn't just um, patterns, but kind of these intuitive theories, understanding of abstract concepts. The way the knowledge is built is much more like the way a scientist builds theories, that there's not just filtering patterns of data but, and finding patterns, but building abstractions, trying out different hypotheses in a curiosity-driven way, the way our basic science research is done. Going out, kids' plays is, has come to be seen as a kind of ex, in sort of informal experimentation. So understanding these two kinds of things, right? These early, the, the early conceptual systems, these kind of intuitive theories of the physical and psychological worlds around us, and these theory-building learning mechanisms, um, I think that is a place where uh, it's really hugely valuable to cognitive science if we can have formal understandings of those things, and hugely valuable to building AI. I think there are, ver there are various kinds of exciting technical developments there. Um, I'll point to one which I think you'll hear a little bit more about tomorrow, uh, which is the idea of probabilistic programming. So this is, this is an idea of, again, a, 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 an idea that has, has some, uh, some roots over the last, say, 10 to 15 years. The Microsoft Infer.net system is one notable example. Um, but it's one of these great places where the early kind of symbolic and more recent statistical paradigms are coming together. And it's a set of tools that actually is allowing us in our models of children uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to kind of capture in the way that you can deal with uncertainty and even, even guide uh, computer vision in a much more object-based way. Uh, to capture this kind of early abstract knowledge and even so something about how it learns. Great. So, well, thank, well thank out of time. Thank you, Josh. Sorry. So, so, <laughs> so we're going to basically reflect a bit on the stage. And, and while I do that, please queue up for questions or raise hands, I guess, for mics uh, to involve you in the discussion as well. One comment that comes to mind or a reflection I'll share with the panel, and maybe we can, you can each comment back or share your thoughts, uh, is some of the, the, um, the, the magic that drew me personally into AI I was reading some of the besides just being fascinated by how my own mind worked in the minds of people, but reading some of Herb Simon's early work, um, uh, like The Sciences of the Artificial, where you had a real sense for the, this notion of 
the prospect of building machinery to deal with ill-defined problems in an open world. Um, and um, we've made great progress, both in the logical world and in the probabilistic and decision theoretic world, in closing those worlds in specific ways. And as, they, as you, I think, as, as Chris and Feifei and, and, and Oren pointed out, with objective fun and Michael, with objective functions that tighten things up. We've been very excited about decision theoretic optimization as we were about logic. But we also had the frame problem in logic. And believe it or not, in decision analysis and decision theory, we have the framing problem. Where do these distinctions come from? What is the objective function? What am I doing right now? And I'm just wanting to get you to comment on whether or not, or what do we do now that we're post-excitement about decision theoretic optimization, where we assume we have probability distributions, we assume we can, we assume we actually encode a utility function, we build planners and single shot, shot decision makers that are doing great work with going from perception to reflection and action, and even meta-reasoning about these things. Um, is it time to basically put that aside and say, okay, that was great progress, but it didn't get, it's, it's fragile, brittle, we don't know how to frame, we don't know how to deal with the frame problem, we need to bring AI into the open world. Chris. Um, yeah, first of all, just a big thanks to Josh for the plug for info.net, that was great. I'll give you the $100 backstage. <laughs> you already um, did. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, probabilistic programming is very exciting, but actually I, I wanted to make some comments that sort of pick up actually on some of the things that Josh and Feifei and, and others have mentioned around this sort of open world issue. How do we move away from this well-defined task where we've got our labels and our objective function, we train it and then it's frozen and it does that one task very well and that's it. And that's a long way from what we think of as artificial intelligence. And every time we solve the task that way, it's immediately defined to be not artificial intelligence. How do, you get, how do you get to something that's much more like the child kind of making sense of the world? And just said, not just statistics. Although I kind of think of statistics in a very general sense. So it, it's sort of, if it's making sense of the data that the child is obser observing, how can it do that? And of course, I don't know all the answers, but I think one of the directions that we could and are pursuing, I think has a lot of promise, is to recognize that the, the, the sort of two modes of cognition, if you like, the sort of the bottom-up fast mode, which is like the trained um, network. I turn around a split second, I can, I can recognize it's Eric, I can recognize a predator. That's some <laughs> fixed, pre-trained same um, concept. Isn't okay. it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly, yeah. So um, same, same neurons, yeah. Um, that's a kind of fixed, fast, bottom-up thing that's sort of pre-trained, that's trained in some other place or some other time. But then there's something that's more bottom down. It's about an internal model of the world. So if we just take object recognition, for example, we've got kind of two ways of doing this. One way is to, is to uh, use a discriminative method to try to learn decision boundaries between apples and oranges. Another way is, is sort of unsupervised, without labels. If you're just given a huge amount of data, if I give you billions and billions of natural images of the world, and I just said compress that data, which is equivalent to modeling the probability distribution of that data, then uh, you could discover the presence of, of regularities. You could discover objects, and you'd discover apples and oranges. You wouldn't know they were called apples and oranges, but now if, you know, mum and dad tells you that one of these is an apple, you know about the whole concept of apples. And that's sort of much more like the, the, you know, the child making sense of the world in this statistical sense. So there's a lot more to AI than this. But I think, um, but let me get to the thing that I think is really exciting. It's just a little personal thing that I, I think is great, which is how do we combine these methods? Because if you look at these two approaches, if you look at um, neural networks, discriminative methods, the, the, they're, they're very fast and they're very accurate, but they need a huge amount of labeled data. If you look at these uh, generative methods or this analysis by synthesis, then you can get away with little or even no label data. But the problem is it's computationally very expensive. You sort of have to test out all the hypotheses. You say, you look at this thing and say, is it an apple? No, not very good. Is it a, 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 an orange? No. Is it a bottle? Yeah, maybe it's a bottle. Okay, is it a red bottle? Yeah, not quite. Is it, is it a blue bottle? Yeah, okay, now it's looking. So you've got this computationally very costly process in principle of exploring all the explanations of the world to find one that fits. Okay, so that's kind of the generative, the generative method. So, so one of them need, needs labels, but is, you know, um, uh, and, and is very fast. The other is slow and doesn't need labels. Can they kind of train each other? Can they mutually train each other? And, it's, and, and I just give you a couple of little evidence points that I just can't, can't resist, because I think this is maybe not completely crazy. So if you go back to the skeletal tracking system in Connect, um, you know, the, 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 the 3D body sensor, 
That system was trained using motion capture data, so real data, but the variability in clothing and infrared reflectance camera noise was so huge that we actually used synthetic data. So we started with the motion capture data and then synthesized all sorts of variants. So a generative model was built by hand and used to create labeled data to train the discriminative system. Here I'm talking about learned generative models. We have a, a system we're working on now called Kyra, which is a hand tracking, a real-time hand tracking system, where those discriminative methods are pretty good, but they're not accurate enough to get super precise details of where, where all the fingers are. So what we do is to use the, gen, the discriminative model, the, it's actually decision forest, but it's like deep neural networks, to give us a very good guess as to where the fingers are, and then we tune the generative model. So, so there's another example of the two working in synergy. So I think that's a, an, one of many possible interesting directions and, for research. And I know there was a recent award-winning paper, or at least it was the best paper, or honorable mention, mention. <laughs> in CVPR by, by Josh working with, with Push Me Coley at Microsoft Research. Really, well, really, um, my Ted just Carney, our graduate student right. at MIT, who worked. Describe the work, though, because yeah. it really aligns with what Chris was saying. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a sort of joint MIT MSR project. Um, also with Vikash Mansinga at my, MIT. And yeah, it, it, it totally aligns with that. I mean, the, uh, that's exactly what we do. So, so Ted just introduced a new probabilistic programming language in which you actually take you know, graphics rendering and put it in there as part of the, the model-based uh, approach. And then you use various bottom-up data-driven techniques. It could be sort of very simple exemplar kind of hashing methods. It could be deep neural networks to do exactly what you're saying, basically to kind of learn a bottom-up uh, route to doing fast inference in a generative model. You know, um, we both know Jeff Hinton's earlier work on the Helmholtz machine. So to me, the most interesting version of deep learning was actually Hinton's sort of mid-90s version. I guess that's when I was just paying most attention to what everyone <laughs> said. <laughs> but, but, you know, how many people know the Helmholtz machine? Um, so go back and read it. Um, it's, uh, this was, there was a science paper called the Wake Sleep Algorithm for Unsupervised Learning in the, in the mid-90s. And many, many people who've uh, been around for as long as some of our us older folks you know, know that, that those ideas are back now in a big way. And, and it's, sort of, it's part of the background behind uh, what Chris was talking about and what we did in this CVPR paper. I, I, so I think that's totally right on. But I would just add, I think from the cognitive development perspective, um, a lot of what you what you call in like what you did in Connect, specifying the generative model by hand, that's also actually the way it works in the brain. In that, it, there's, I think there's a tendency to overweight how much learning goes on in infants. Evolution did much of that for us. The idea that there's what, what, what we've sort of put into our system, or what in some form is there in how you train Connect, a kind of a graphics engine. We we believe, and there's I think good reason to see this from cognition and neuroscience that there's something like a graphics engine in your head. Um, and that evolution has put certain, you know, we don't really know exactly what form this is, but has certain, put certain understanding of the three-dimensional physical world and how, you know, that leads to images. It's not just graphics, but physics. I think a lot of the, the phrase I like to use these days to describe the infant core knowledge system is the game engine in your head. A lot of the pieces that are in modern game engines, which include graphics engine, physics engine, and even simple kind of planning yeah. engines, I think are part of what evolution has given us. And so we, we need to understand, I think, to build more human like AI, how to integrate statistical learning with all those components of, of that system. Yeah. I'd like to just take a minute. I'm, I'm worried that we're going to lose some of our audience or at least lull them into an early nap by uh, just reflecting. Uh, uh, just just okay. give me a minute, Eric. Sure. Sure. Uh, just reflecting on, on, on the panel uh, without getting into too many mechanistic details. I think what's really interesting, you never know when you put a panel like this together, there was uh, a note of agreement, which I would state as simply, there's something missing, right? There's a lot of exciting results, but there's something missing in AI. I think everybody reflected that. And then there was also a note of disagreement, which is always the more exciting thing with the panel. And not a disagreement that's aggressive, but we're reflecting very different methodologies about how to get at that uh, ingredient. So let me repeat that in more uh, explicit terms. And again, I, I apologize if doing that, I, I slightly disturb what people said. My main thing is just to get the point across. So I feel like uh, a lot of what Chris was talking about is, OK, we've got supervised learning. It's got limitations. Let's figure out. Uh, how to extend learning algorithms, whether it's with better ways to get labeled data or with unsupervised techniques, and kind of sketches out a research program of unsupervised learning. And the thing that I've learned over the years, when I was young, I was always right. And, and now I learned that there's methodologies and each one has uh, benefits and, and, and pitfalls. So the obvious benefit of that is this really interesting algorithmic work to be done. It's really important to extend the state of the art. The potential pitfall is that 
at the end of that, we'll have a whole class of algorithms and not be that much further along towards, towards intelligence. It's the next that's, 2%. It's the next it's, 2%. Right. So he, you're outlining a, a methodology for the next 2%. That's, <clears throat> that's great. If you go to what uh, Josh has articulated, I think, incredibly well, he said, look, there's something incredibly tantalizing. And all of us have had kids. All of us who are interested in AI get into it thinking about it. There's something incredibly tantalizing about human cognition. He's saying we've got more data on that, and we can also start to build systing using, you know, probabilistic mumble foo, which is the mechanism de jour for some people, and you know, <laughs> give, give it two years, uh, uh, and uh, or, or whatever. But 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 the point is, uh, you know, there'll be another DARPA initiative. Uh, but 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 the point is that. Uh, it's very, very tantalizing and very, very exciting, gets at the deep problems. That's the benefit and also a new source of data. The potential pitfall is around um, uh, are we actually able to build systems with stronger capabilities? Right, so uh, it's it's uh, you know it, that that's a key question, right? Whereas if you look at some of these other systems, they have these well-defined objective functions, and you can see. So that's what I see some of the trade-off. And in general, cognitive science, again, to just you know uh, paint things with a very broad brush, has repeatedly uh, given us deeper insights, right? Starting with the work of Newland Simon and proceeding into the human mind, and at the same time, has not been the shortest path that AI has produced to generating more effective technology. Uh, uh, potential pitfall. I, I'll just go through two more and I'm done. Uh, and then uh, I, I want to make sure that I have an equal opportunity to offend everybody. Uh, and, and then uh, what I heard and what um, I think you was, could stop now. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I, I'm actually try, trying to, to, to be balanced. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to say it. And, and you'll see that you know it's not like I've got the answer. That's not where I'm going. Uh, I felt like Michael was saying, Look, we're excited about this kind of ill-formed stuff, but let's not forget. Let's not forget that when we formalize things, that's when we're really able to make progress as computer scientists, right? I, I heard that when I was saying. So again, the obvious methodology is: look, let's take that two percent, formalize it, solve the problem algorithmically or empirically as good computer scientists, and move on. And that's very, very satisfying. Leads to great theses and papers. And the worry is, all right, we'll keep going, but we won't get there. And then. Uh, Feifei, aside from the conversation about her, her child, which I could really relate to as somebody as, as a five-year-old, was pointing out there's a lot more to AI than perception when she and others make great progress. Let's think about all these problems, you know, reasoning and planning and what have you and representation. And of course, when you think about those, that's great. The risk is we get hideously lost, right, because those are very uh, ill for from. Last thing, our methodology. We've identified these grand challenge problems, as I mentioned. We're trying to connect the dots. The good news is we do have metrics, and, and uh, we, it'll be very clear if we make progress. The bad news is, again, we might not have a clue on how to do that. We're much more uh, data-driven and challenge-driven than that we have a particular algorithmic uh, philosophy, which, again, can mean we could get uh, hideously lost. OK, great, Thank great, you. Orin. So let's open up to the audience for some, some questions from the audience and comments. And uh, we see some folks coming in. We have a, a, a runner here. Yeah, Ken. Hi, Eric. Um, oh. Is this on? Yep. Yes, we hear great. you great. OK, I just want to build on, on what, what Josh and Orin were saying. If we continue doing nothing but picking a problem and formalizing it and solving it, we'll never actually achieve what we want to achieve. You have to actually start taking a different perspective. Think about what you're doing as building an organism. An organism does multiple things. It solves multiple problems. It formulates its own learning goals. Now, there's a line of research in AI and cognitive science called cognitive architecture that does this. There's some beautiful examples where work's been going on for decades. If you look up ACTAR or SOAR, you'll find that they've done an amazing range of modeling phenomena, but also building systems that actually are practical and used as performance systems. And if you think in terms of, for instance, what humans are, a human-level AI really is a software social organism that's got human-level capabilities in all of the reasoning and learning it's capable of doing. And that's a way of formulating the goal that's completely different from here's the technology, here's the problem. It's actually a specification of what it is we're trying to get to. And if you think about building simple versions of that, start with the equivalent of shacks if you're thinking of an architectural metaphor and build up to skyscrapers, then that's a path that'll actually get us where we're going. 
And there's still plenty of room for people doing the traditional pick a problem and solve it and gather all of our evaluation data and all that stuff. All that's producing a stream of ideas, but if there's not an equivalent set of people who are putting those together in building organisms, you can't tell if these are going to go anywhere. Thanks, That's Ken. what I would suggest. Next, next question, any comments on Ken's reflection? Or we just say, yep. Well, I think that the idea, very much the idea of a system that can make its own goals and make its own sub-goals, I mean, it's, it's another way to put, I think, what Michael was saying, right, which is that there's that somehow we have this kind of intelligence that can, that just doesn't just have a single task objective function, but can make our own objective functions and can decide, oh, well, I'm going to work on this thing, like try and understand AI, and then formulate sub-goals and sub-sub-goals as part of plans to do that. Integrating that kind of approach with our sort of expected utility optimization toolkit that's driven so much of the excitement in recent uh, AI sort of from a machine learning point of view, I think is, is really okay. important. The question from Peter. Yeah, so first, thanks to all of you for a very interesting panel. There's so many things I'd love to react to from a technical perspective. But since the title was Myths and Realities of AI, there's one, I think, huge myth that's sort of being perpetuated by some of the language that's being used in the, in the panel and the lead up to the panel, which is when we use terms like AI winter and golden age and AI spring, it gives this um, impression that AI as a field has had some huge breakthroughs um, and then nothing's happened for a long time. And then another huge breakthrough, and nothing's happened. And there's this, I think there's this sense right now that there's been this huge breakthrough, but I think the reality is instead that there's been this steady incremental progress over many, many years, and that a lot of this, I think, um, you know, Chris gave this sense a little bit that, you know, with neural networks, for instance, um, you know, there's this notion that this so-called, you know, deep learning is this huge breakthrough, but really there's, it's because of the people who've stuck to it over many, many years and made these small breakthroughs um, and small progress. And this is happening, I think, all through AI, that for a while everybody was doing symbolic and then, no, it's got to be probabilistic. And for a while, SVMs were the breakthrough. And then, <laughs> and I think it's, you know, the, this is, it's a, it's a harmful myth in the sense that it causes people to, to jump on a bandwagon and everybody go to in one direction, where really, you know, the way for progress is that for everybody to stick to the, you know, the, um, their, uh, their area, and there's many different really promising areas in AI, and I think, you know, we should have this vision of a steady Absolutely. incremental, I mean, we're, you know, at the point today where, where um, where you know Jeanette Wing, who I'm thinking of, we think of all of his uh, you know misformal methods. It gave a 45 minute talk on AI, which is great. That's great to see you do that, Jeanette. Um, <laughs> but but I, but I want you know but I, I you know I think we we also you know, it's really exciting and it's tempting for all of us to say yes, this is a golden age and everybody should jump on it. But I think we all do need to also recognize that the whole field of computer science needs to keep moving in the, you know, the steady incremental progress. And we probably will get to a point that where the hype is gone and where there's not the, the, the news coverage again. And you know, it'll be <laughs> tempting to say that that's an AI winter. But really, you know, we should keep, keep pushing. And, and so point. I think that's a big myth. Sure. We need it's to, a fabulous really comment, Peter. Thanks it. very much. Over here. Uh, Eric, a great panel and uh, very uh, thought provoking. Uh, I just have a very simple question. Many of the panelists mentioned that uh, there are all these terms with no definitions from a mathematical point of view. Uh, do we have the right mathematics and formalisms to formalize the concepts that AI is struggling with? What, does it, what will it take to turn AI into a science? Well, first of all, I'm not sure if people up here will say it's not a science, but go ahead and reflect on the question. <laughs> Where to begin? Any any comments? Uh, you know, the the speaker, is, uh, the questioner is quite pejorative, calling it uh, not a science. And in response, I would say that the question really bespeaks a tremendous ignorance of the field and of philosophy of science. Uh, most scientific terms, uh, starting with the cell. Uh, are very difficult to define. Wittgenstein's philosophy of language has shown that most terms are actually difficult to define. Even the notion of definition is questionable. Uh, also, most science doesn't have a mathematical underpinning in the sense. Uh, physics may be an, an exception. Uh, look at biology, look at geology. So I, I don't really think the question merits discussion the way it was posed. And, and, uh, and the, the people know that I, I asked the, the panelists to be as pointed as they'd like. So. 
<laughs> and then again. Oh, okay. wait, then let me give a stronger <laughs> and tell how I really feel. We can have a question over here. So um, it seems that the panelists hey, agree that, you know, we've had some great successes recently and it's good to celebrate them, but also that, you know, there's these other things that we really need to focus on to get to AI. And we saw various, I think, great ideas about how to get there. But, but the, thing, the question that was on my mind through all of this is that that part of the dissection in some ways uh, is not that different from the discussion that happened at Dartmouth. And so the question I think that I would like to ask the panelists is, what have we learned from the failures of the last 50 years about where to get in these things? Because surely it's by learning from those failures that we're going to succeed sometime in the future when, when we didn't in the past. Any comments? Chris? Yeah, a, a thought on this. And I, I, I guess, and uh, you know, the, the, the good old fashioned days of AI sort of predate my involvement, but, but I guess, you know, the 50,000 foot view is that there was a, a move away from, as it were, handcrafted rules. Um, to sort of lurching to the other end of the spectrum, which is sort of learning from data. And neural networks are kind of um, the, these black dot model that, that learn from data and have very little um, prior knowledge built into them, with the exception probably of convolution, which sort of captures local translation invariants. And I think an interesting question, Josh sort of hinted at this earlier, is around what sort of prior knowledge should we build in and what prior knowledge does the brain build in? I mean, the genome doesn't have enough bits in three billion base pairs to specify all the synapses in the brain. Most of that has to be learned. But there are a lot of bits in the genome, and you could specify things like, I mean, why would the brain not encode the fact that it's going to be born into a, a 3D world and it's going to see lots of 2D projections of that world? Why wouldn't you bake that into the, the structure of the visual cortex? It seems to me you would. And so, you know, again, one of the things, you know, that we're, many of us are quite interested in is how do we back away a little bit from that extreme end of just black box neural goop that kind of learns anything, and how do we bake in some high-level prior knowledge? I think this is where probabilistic programming comes in as a very efficient and elegant way of encoding some of that high-level prior knowledge, but still having all the details um, learned from data. So I think there probably maybe is a very interesting time to go back and revisit some of that very early literature, because you know, very smart people thought long and hard about this, and they did didn't have fast computers, they didn't have neural nets, they didn't have um, you know, tons of data. But there were smart people, they thought about this long and hard, and maybe there are ideas that we can take and then transplant them into the modern context. So I think we've, we've lurched from one extreme to the other extreme, and now we're sort of backing away a little bit and finding more of a middle ground. It's very interesting times. And, and yeah, sort of more generally, I think, learning to be wary of extremes, right? Learning to look at the, at the different eras of our field and try to say, well, when some really smart people said something and then it didn't turn out to work, then there's some lessons to be learned from that. But part of it is to understand, well, what was the really right thing that they were on to? Can we extract that out from the things that maybe they just, either other things they didn't know how to do or they didn't have the technology or the data to make these things happen? You know, again, and Pedro, of course, your, your work is, you know, I think, I think of, say, for example, Markov logic as an example of understanding, okay, there was something really right about logic. What was right about logic wasn't deductive inference. That's too weak and brittle, but abstraction, right? And if we can combine the abstraction of predicate logic and then combine that with the power of statistical learning and inference, we could do some pretty cool things. And, and I, you know, I think as a field, learning that. And also, kind of, I think, having, since learning is the theme of the day or the decade, um, the a more sophisticated appreciation for what learning is really about and understanding that learning isn't just um, something you can just follow your intuitions on, but there's a science of learning and that maybe, maybe the way that um, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in machine learning or AI will, will and, and again, uh, to maybe foreshadow something that you might be talking about soon, evolution is kind of the real learning algorithm in a sense, right? Or there are t there's learning over many different timescales if you think of learning in the very broadest sense of adapting to the statistical structure of your environment. There's aspects of the three-dimensional world and the fact that we perceive it through light and sound that is millions of years old, <laughs> right? And, or, or even more. And then there's things which happen on other timescales of years, months, days, seconds, and so on. And understanding that no one of those is the right time scale to focus on, but understanding how uh, you know, a brain or an artificial brain or an intelligence system adapting to the structure of its environment over all those time scales is something that we're going to have to take seriously. So, very so just uh, to make a comment, first of all, I think evolution has already encoded one prior structure for uh, coping with the 3D world, which is we have two eyes not one eye. So um, just, just a little comment. Um, I think, I think uh, this whole um, um, uh, discussion about 
what's next? And we, we said technically we talked a lot about programming language. Um, um, the other thing I think we should uh, consider is actually go back to the early AI concept, but in a modernized way is think about knowledge, knowledge formation and knowledge acquisition and common sense knowledge. And, and here, you know, speaking from a vision point of view, uh, people like Larry Zitnick and uh, MSR is actually leading a lot of those uh, research and also in the AI2, you guys are doing knowledge. And, and I think this is one topic that uh, we should pay a lot more attention to, to extract us out of simply statistical pattern matching for one task, but start to formulate that kind of backend structure of reasoning, give us a path to abstract um, information and form relationships and be able to reason um, in an ad hoc way, more ad hoc and situational awareness way rather than just go for that um, and task. Well, thank you very much. We're having to break now uh, to a break for all of you. And um, sorry, we can't take the last question. Uh, I want to thank the panelists. I have to say that I had a fabulous, it, it had to be the most exciting green room I've ever been in for we, we some research done, I think. <laughs> and they can all share some insights with you at the break. And there'll be plenty of time to meet each of these wonderful people and have some, some insightful conversations. Thanks, everybody. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.